Hey everybody, Charles Eisenstein here with my uh, honored guest, uh, Philip Eisenstein, who you might, uh, as you might suspect, is related to me. He's my third of four sons um, and uh, 18 years old. And uh, we thought we'd uh, have a little conversation that um, kind of on an intergenerational theme, obviously, and just kind of see what comes out of it. Philip said he had some things in mind to talk about, but he hasn't divulged them to me yet. So this is going to be happening in real time. And uh, hey, Philip, thanks for uh, coming up with this idea, unless it was mom's idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was mom's idea. I did encourage her, though. <laughs> uh -huh. Cool. So yeah, what's on your mind? Yeah, well, so um, I'm 18 years old now. I just graduated high school and I am starting to enter the wider world. Um, and I've come to feel an anxiety about my future, both my personal future and relating to what I want to pursue and the kind of life I want to live, um, but also the material future around me of the world, of the country, climate, you know, politics, conflict, um, inequality. And I guess I, I was curious if you like went through a similar, if you had similar anxieties and worries when you were younger, and if you could say something to yourself in that kind of crisis or questioning moment, what would you say now, knowing what you know? Hmm. Yeah. I definitely had those anxieties. <clears throat> I remember <clears throat> when, when, um, so this was, you know, I grew up after the cold war really was, was over, but there was still kind of lingering, you know, and like, I was pretty worried about nuclear Armageddon to the point where if there was like a, like a thunderstorm sometimes I, you know, and like a flash of light, I was wondering, Oh, I wonder if that's the, the flash of a nuclear bomb. Um, and, and, Climate change wasn't really quite a thing yet until when I was a teenager, I started to become aware of it. Um, but also like from the influence of my father, there was like this general like kind of dystopian tint on everything that was happening. Like I did not believe that the world was getting better and better. I was really aware, aware of horrible things happening on earth. And I became more aware of those as I got to about your age, you know, and started reading radical literature. And it hadn't really coalesced, though, the way it has for your generation. Um, because up until my generation, each generation was materially better off than the previous one. And, and you know, life expectancy was higher than it had been in the previous generation. And there was less infant mortality. And, you know, by a lot of um, objective standards, things were getting better and better. And, and so we expected that to continue. And the future was going to be this amazing place. And I, I don't think that that, that 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 basic assumption is still present. And, and so like, it's like the anxiety, like I sensed <clears throat> something wrong, like, like this foreboding, um, the sense that things are not going to be okay. And it was, a, it was, I guess, a little harder to, to put um, persuasive words to that feeling at the time because we were still very much in the mindset of technology is going to solve all our problems. You know, science is going to fix it. 
and the future is going to be great. And now that isn't there. So, so, and there's, and the problems are so much more obvious and, and to ignore them requires a greater and greater effort of willful blindness. So anyway, that's a long, long way of saying, yeah, I felt it, but it wasn't so obvious what I was all upset about. Mm -hmm. And I think it's more obvious now. I don't know about like your peers, you know, um, I mean, do you think, Philip, do you think this is a generalized feeling? I haven't even gotten to answer your question. What would I say to myself? <laughs> but but do you think it's a generalized feeling? Yeah, definitely. In I mean, different ways. Um, so, like, I'm aware of the things that I'm aware of. Um, and, um, yeah, like, my friend's attitudes towards things like science, um, they're very aware of like the monetary and industrial aspect of a lot of science and medicine nowadays. And they kind of take it for granted that, yeah, sometimes pharmaceutical companies will, you know, do something completely unrelated to public health that makes them billions of dollars. And the price to do that is to pay a fine. That's only a portion of their, problem. like all of this stuff um, to, a certain extent all my friends are aware of um and they just accept it as a fact of the world right because they can't change any of it mm -hmm. it's something that's happening happening to them happening to the world um and i know some people who have um deeper concerns too i've had some conversations with my friends about kind of um the dissolution of religion and the kind of hole that left in the human psyche um, that was then filled with various things, a huge, you know, boom of ideologies and philosophies in the past couple hundred years. Um, and in our day, or maybe just before our day, um, it was really dominated by capital and science. Um, but even that they're not fully held in anymore. And a lot of people my age are kind of embracing a more nihilistic worldview, you know, um, no mm -hmm. metaphysics they feel is strongly cultural, culturally held. Um, and so mm -hmm. what are they supposed to see as real anymore? You know, they're bouncing between everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, nihilism has always been most popular among teenagers, hmm. like, you know, going back to the beginnings of it, you know, and I think part of that is, is a transition process where the childhood meanings break down and, and kind of like this naive sense that, that the universe will provide the universe in the form of your parents, you know, um, however imperfectly. Uh, and a certain kind of order to the world and the meanings that you've inherited from your parents, they, they may not be satisfying. And also there's even like a, um, I think a, a process of brain development where the uh, rational mind is fully developed by age 13, 14. And, and, you know, you kind of got it all figured out. You think you've got it all figured out and you extend uh, the those cognitive forms of of reason and logic uh, to their limits, <clears throat> and what do you end up with? You cannot <clears throat> break through their confines um, on their own terms. You cannot find, especially when you're immersed in a. Uh, and then, you know, maybe I'm speaking more of our culture, but when you're immersed in a scientific worldview that says that reality is nothing but atoms and void bouncing around according to mathematical forces. Well, where's the meaning? You know, in the end, if, you, if that's what your metaphysics fundamentally is, which is what we've inherited from science, then, then it sure seems like any meaning or purpose is a projection onto nothing. Uh, and that's nihilism, right? I mean, I used to be a nihilist too, but then I, you know, thought there wasn't any point in it. So I stopped. 
<laughs> but but that's it, right. It's not as a joke, but but that it. So it is like it is like the despair phase of reaching the limits of the search for meaning and not finding it. And that um, surrender and that despair process that that which has you know it's not just intellectual. Uh, <clears throat> The the apparently I, someone told me that the Vikings even had this like the in in ancient Norse times, uh, young people would go through a time of the ashes where they would just like basically, you know, cover themselves in ashes in the, in the longhouse or whatever and and just like not even get out of bed, uh, grappling with this existential despair. But there's something on the other side of it, and that's what I wanted to say that is not irrational, but it cannot be found through reason. Other cultures had initiation experiences that would put you in touch with the transcendent dimension of life, which also corresponds to, uh, according to an author I used to read years and years ago, Joseph Chilton Pierce, he said it was um, um, corresponded to um, a phase of brain development that is not well recognized, at least it wasn't in the eighties. Um, but that corresponds to the um, graduation into transcendent thinking, which is um, transpersonal as well. It, it understands being as more than separation, more than an individual. And therefore it corresponds to the discovery and embodiment of your purpose which see because part of the, the the feeling the nihilistic feeling of meaninglessness it's like what am i doing here what's what's my purpose why am i here what is a human being for what am i for and if there's no answer to that if the and if the culture's only answer is to pretend that it's meaningful and to to maximize your self-interest that doesn't do it that doesn't satisfy the the quest the question the quest for the knowledge that you need um, to embody. So, th you know, maybe if I could answer your first question, if I could speak to myself at 18, I would affirm, I'd say, your secret suspicion that you are here for something magnificent is true that you are here to 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 contribute to the unfolding of the of of the magnificence of creation to to contribute to to more life and more beauty in the world and and you know what i mean when i say magnificent it doesn't mean you know famous or or successful in the outward sense necessarily but something like magnificent to you, something that that makes you say, yeah, this is what I'm here to do. And, and so, you know, I had that suspicion. I think most young people have like this, this spark of knowledge that, that something tremendous is supposed to happen in my life. And I'm, and there's something that's supposed to happen beyond, oh, I'm, you know, a fully capable adult now. Th there's another stage that's supposed to happen besides mastery of your material and social skills, and now I can make a living. No, you're not mm -hmm. here to make a living. You know, you're, you're here to live, not to make a living. You're not here to survive until your death. You're here to, to change the world. That's why you were born. You're, you're, and it doesn't need to be a huge, big thing, but you're here to make an imprint and the world is different than if you had not been here and different in a good way. And, th and that, yeah, that's what I would communicate to myself because it took me a long time and fighting a lot of, fighting a lot of doubt, you know, and um, to, to come to that realization. And maybe religions used to have that, you know, but... Um, the religions of our time have been gutted 
and replaced with kind of an anti-religion, as you were saying, of capital and and science. Hmm. Yeah, I can. That yearning, that knowledge that there is meaning and the recognition that that meaning isn't found in a lot of what's been presented to us. Um, something I can see peeking through in a lot of places. I'm reminded um, when I was at the Green School for a few months, I remember a lot of the students were asking, like, why do our grades matter? Like, why do why should we care about this so much? You know, we're spending so many hours a day here doing what? Um, and the teachers were basically like, well, your grades matter because it'll go onto your transcript, which will go into your college application. Um, and then it, that'll determine whether or not, you know, you can get a good job in the future. So you should really care about this. Um, but they didn't really care. Almost nobody in my class, um, small class, 40, 40 or 50 people, almost nobody cared, really. Um, it was a performance and they knew that. Um, and they were looking for something to care about, something mm -hmm. to really devote themselves to. But what we had there, yeah, yeah it, it didn't fit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's kind of my cynical view of what school is for. It's to, to uh, practice you in caring about things for, you know, external rewards. But I think... You know, this um, refusal to care, it's a, it's a healthy sign you know, of, of, your, your, of your classmates in that school that they maybe didn't even bother to, to enact the performance. We believed it a lot more when I was in high school. Uh, and maybe that was because I was in the, you know, gifted programs and stuff, but people really cared about the grades and they really believed that it was going to be their ticket to success. Uh, and this whole story of your transcript, a good school, you know, like that, that whole story of a life. But it just seems, seems really bleak, doesn't it? To, Like it, and, and it violates this sense that we have that we are here for something else. There's something else in what you said, though. Um, yeah. Dang it. Sorry, I'm tip of my tongue. Um, The performance, pretending to care. Um, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to put it put it down, and I'll probably come back. Um, yeah, maybe maybe it's that. Oh yeah. Gosh, I've ever had this thing where it's like just swimming in and out of, yeah. out of your head. Mm -hmm. um, it drives you crazy to have uh, like a valid intuition that is not affirmed or reinforced by the environment that you're in, especially, you know, school, which, which I mean, these are supposed to be your mentors and your guides, you know, and wise adults who you, you put yourself in their hands for hours a day and they are supposed to be teaching you how to be human. Um, and if they deny like this absolutely core part of the human being, then it's really hard to, um, it's really confusing. And to be offered success of the individual as a substitute for what we really want also launches 
in some people an addictive pattern where you think that this thing that you're searching for, which is meaning to, to contribute meaningfully can be satisfied by, uh, you know, outward measures of success and it doesn't satisfy it. So then you need more of it and more of it and more of it. Hmm. And this is what happens to, you know, a lot of highly quote successful people. They've made a billion dollars and like they've done it, they've made it. Well, why aren't they happy now? Why aren't they fulfilled? Maybe another billion would do it. But often at some point they realize that no more billions are going to do it. And then they actually do start looking, you know, for, um, what they really want, you know, some kind of authentic, um, occupation. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it's going back to your earlier point, um, about the state of the world, you know, and there are a lot of despair narratives right now about the inevitability of catastrophic climate change, for example, uh, or economic collapse or, um, totalitarian takeover, like all of these, you know, for, for whatever political identity you have, there is a despair narrative that mm -hmm. will present itself to you. And these, um, are poisonous. They, they, they are telling you that, that your, your desire to contribute to life and beauty on earth won't, won't work. Uh, it'll be washed away in the flood of catastrophe that is inevitably facing us. So they're, 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 those narratives rob you of, they, they, they attempt to rob you of life, you know, and their invitation is, well, if it's hopeless, then, then and nothing you do is going to mean anything because it's going to be wiped away. So, so then you might as well conform, you might as well, you know, live hedonically, you know, conform to the uh, program of individual fulfillment and it's just like so bleak, you know, because they deny the possibility of what you're seeking. And, you know, I often just talk about the, um, the false assumptions that underlie those despair narratives, which basically require that we are helpless, separate individuals and what the, ch and, and the changes you make don't matter. They, they, that our only power to change lies in our ability to exercise a force on the world, which is um, a kind of scientific thinking, Newtonian thinking, you know, something moves when you exert a force. So the more force you can exert, the more you can move things, but you're just one person. And what can you do in the face of these enormous forces that, that we face today? not much. So you're helpless, you're powerless. So you might as well just go home. You know, that whole line of thinking, um, is very deeply ingrained in, in scientific metaphysics, you know, in the metaphysics that underlie science. And again, it contradicts an intuitive knowing that, the, that, that the choices you make, especially those that are, that are coming from love and from care for the people around you, are significant. Like they feel significant. They feel important. They feel like the world will be better for those decisions or worse if you don't care for those who need your care around you, right? It feels important in that moment. And so you have to override that feeling in order to, well, you're asked to override that feeling then. Um, in the logic of, you know, what difference is it going to make in the big picture? You're just one person and sea levels are going to wipe us all, you know, rise 50 feet and destroy everything anyway. 
right? I mean, like, what does it matter? Like, so, so it's contradicting that valid, authentic recognition of what's important and how to live. And it's always about the source of meaning is always service to something beyond yourself. Always. That's not the only thing you should do in life because you have to receive in equal measure to what you give. But receiving does not give you, does not fill the need for meaning. It fills other needs and it's important to, to absorb beauty, to absorb pleasure, to, to um, enjoy life, you know, to avail yourself of the wonders of creation. It's super important, but it won't fill the need for meaning. For that, you have to give. Hmm. Hmm. Sorry, I went on a really long time there. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very true. Um, what you said about, um, you know, like people when faced with these despair narratives, um, you know, some of them, they might feel like, well, you know, in the face of this huge coming calamity, yeah, might as well just go home and keep, you know, conform, whatever. Um, I think a lot of people in my generation, maybe a bit older than me, are kind of, um, kind of resigning themselves to the world. You know, they explore a lot of radical ideologies, um, but then they enter the real world and they're like, well, that was fun but now I have to worry about my taxes, you know, and maybe they do uh, eventually, you know, pursue the American dream and dream of someday having a house and a family. Um, but they do that having seen what that brings, you know, they do that maybe having been in a broken home, you know, a family with a, an aggressive, angry father with an emotionally repressed mother, if they do continue performing that, they do it knowing that there's something better and they don't fully immerse themselves into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like they don't fully believe in the dream. They don't believe in the promise. But there's not much of an alternative presented to them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm just kind of putting putting what you're saying in, in slightly different words. So they resign themselves to it, but without hope. And yeah. and again, there's some see. But the, another thing is, like, people are trying different experiments. You know, different um, ways of of making family, of, of relationship, of living together, um, which is hard in this country. I mean, even for such practical reasons as zoning regulations, you know, and, and just the physical infrastructure. Um, but there are people who are at least creating temporary experiences and sometimes long-term experiences of a different way. Like you, like you guys went to that, uh, uh, conference at Twin Oaks, you know, and that would be an example. Um, and, you know, we can't idealize those places. I mean, they, they tend to import all of the maladies of the surrounding society that are expressed in maybe some different form. Um, but sometimes you can have an experience that affirms your belief, not only that the way that most Americans are living is um, a recipe for misery, for addiction, for broken families, you know, for, for um, chronic disease, for poverty, for all, all that stuff, but also that there is another possibility that there's that, that, you know, it's, a more beautiful world is possible and we don't know how to get there, but it exists. 
and yeah, like, you know, for many years, I, I, I so here's maybe something that might, might be useful. I, I kind of hung back from fully participating in society because I'm like, well, this is wrong. This isn't the kind of society I want to live in. I want to live in an eco village, you know, where, where it's normal for people to make long eye contact with each other and, 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 you know, all, and who are communicating in um, a masterful way and uh, where we are uh, beautifying and, and enlivening the land that we live on in right relationship and, and all of these things, you know, ecological, social, um, that's what I want. And this is nothing like that. So I'm not going to step in, you know, and I found myself hanging back from life for a long time. Um, and, but unable really to stay back from life. I mean, you know, I didn't really have the skills or the means or the fortune to, um, even try to, you know, start an eco village at age 25 or whatever. Um, and even those end up being disappointing often if you really want perfection, you know? So eventually what I learned is that, yeah, like, I do have to step in maybe 90% in order to maybe pull the world 10% in the direction I want it to go. And that, that's like the point of that little movie I made, you know, the fall, mm -hmm. the, that two minute film, yeah. you know, where they're standing on the brink of the pit of hell and seeing the suffering down there. And they're like, okay, we're going to take the plunge. We're going to go down there to, to help. And, but when you do that, you become a person of that realm subject to all of its limitations and 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 immersed in its belief systems and all you carry with you as you take that plunge is this like cellular memory of a possibility of a better world and and a deeply coded instruction set on how you can help move this world toward that more beautiful future but, but it's a very deep, it's a, it's a, it's an unconscious code, you know, and here you are thrust into this world of wrongness where everything from birth to death is wrong in our society, you know, literally from birth, you know, the, the hospital birth setting, um, and the medicalization of birth and, and the, the, I mean, the whole thing, um, to, to the way that, you know, old people are, you know, put into nursing homes and cut off from community. And I mean, the whole thing, you know, um, in, in the, in the political campaign I'm involved in, I just like people are, you know, coming, sharing their knowledge, you know, about, I just got one today about Haiti, you know, and the, uh, horrible things that have been done in the name of philanthropy in Haiti and, and, the U S government's complicity in it, you know, and just the, the suffering of the people there. And, and it's just so dark, you know, the whole thing. Um, and at the same time, so much beauty springs up everywhere, even in the worst places, so much joy is still available. And anyway, Yeah, so so this is actually similar to, to this is another piece of that that intuitive knowledge that we stepped into. I jokingly call it the you know sixth or seventh circle of hell. Um, with a a mission, with a uh, um, a, a code to participate in its evolution. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What you said about stepping in 90% and maybe you can pull it 10%. Um, 
what I said earlier about people who resign themselves, you know, to conforming, I think maybe while a lot of them do resign themselves to the material um, aspect of it, the material situation of nuclear home or capitalism or whatever, because they don't necessarily resign resign themselves mentally, there are different ways of acting and thinking that are available from within those those conditions. You know, maybe they uh, live in a box with their family, um, but maybe they don't send their kid to public school, right? Um, right. Maybe they become a manager and, you know, the shop never got unionized, but maybe they don't <laughs> believe in crushing a union with the, you know, same... Right, the fierceness that their predecessors did, or maybe they plant a garden, you know, and share the mm -hmm. food with their neighbors, or maybe yeah. they 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 do like one one little piece that is of a more beautiful world, and and you know spread that idea and normalize that and and sow that seed in the collective. Yeah, and I'm just thinking about like when that kind of, um, you know, like my generation is, I think, full of that, you know, full of like um, that yearning to make beauty, even when it's um, in the mis midst of all this ugliness, um, and even when maybe materially it doesn't look like they can do a lot. Um, and I don't know, I guess I'm excited to see us enter the world with, you know, with, with that yearning and see us enter politics with that yearning and maybe see the d details start to shift slowly. Yeah. You know, young people have always had that yearning. Um, and, but, you know, and, and they try to, uh, accomplish what their ideals ask of them and they inevitably fail or seem to fail or accomplish just one half of 1% of it. But, you know, we've had hundreds of generations now and they've built a platform um, of consciousness that you're standing on now and you'll add your piece too. Like every, you know, this is like, this is a paradox here. I would like to say as a partial truth, in a way, everything is getting better and better. Like that, that ideology of science and technology, there is a kind of a truth in it that, that because of the dedicated idealistic efforts of, of invisible heroes, generation after generation, um, embodying life to try to live and to try to make more life, we have actually evolved our consciousness. And none of that, none of that work has been in vain. You know, I think of, of my parents' generation, you know, grandma, um, who, you know, from my perspective seemed, you know, like, like a beautiful, beautiful person, but not at the, you know, her ideas were not really revolutionary, you know, um, they were pretty run of the mill, but actually when she was 18, you know, and, and the guidance counselor said, well, you're very smart. You could become an executive secretary. You know, she was like, no, I'm going to be an attorney. You know, I'm going to like, she, and she went to Yale law school and, and where there was like, one of the first women ever to go. And it was like incredibly audacious. What was a breakthrough in consciousness at the time seems to us like, well, you know, half the people in law school or more now or, or medical school, or they're women, you know, what's the big deal? Like that wasn't, but no, that was radical. Like the breakthrough that she made that is normalized now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's probably you know, things about me that seem like pretty, you know, unexceptional and like, you know, yeah, dad, we get it, dad, you know, 
but that in my time were like really um, audacious, you know? Mm. And so in that sense, I think we are evolving um, at the same time as we are devolving and um, losing a lot of our, of our capacities our even our cognitive capacities and our strength of character um, losing it to technology and to a really dysfunctional, sick system um, where just, you know, basic skills of being human are, are um, eroding. So it's a paradox for me, like this, this, um, evolution and devolution at the same time. And I feel like it could kind of go either way, you know, we could be at the moment of a turnaround or we could, like what I'm saying is it's not guaranteed. This evolution involves choices that we make, you know, the future in a sense does depend on your choices. You are powerful. It's not, you know, neither, neither catastrophe, you know, dystopia, nor transcendence, utopia are inevitable. There's, there's an element of choice that presents itself to each generation. And if you believe and, and, and trust that that is true, then you'll take the choice seriously. I can ask you a question, Philip. Sure. Um, you know, so you asked me, like, what would I say to the 18 year old version of myself? But I could turn the question around. Um, cause you know, the 18 year old version of myself, maybe new things that I've forgotten, you know? Mm. And so, you know, you've seen plenty of adults and how they live and how they think. What would you tell? the 56 year old version of yourself. Like if you could speak into the future, what kind of things do you feel like that adults forget that, you know, not that they become wiser and transcend, but that they forget <laughs> that they should keep in mind. Hmm. You can, you don't I have would, to answer. Oh, you have a... Yeah, I would yeah. tell the 56-year-old version of me not to forget what it's like to know nothing about the world, about myself, um, or not to know nothing, but not to forget how rich and full of meaning and wonder everything is, not to forget that it's all available to me to constantly drink in and feel and experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I know, I often notice that about babies. They're just like drinking it in, you know, mm -hmm. and, and preconceived ideas about the world do not get in the way. Yeah. Yeah, I was, um, I'm writing now, just earlier today, uh, an essay for my college application, um, 
there are kind of two ideas I'm working on. I think I'm going to write two and then and then decide which one I want to include. But one of them is on just the idea of deserving, you know, the idea that people embody some kind of moral value that determines how you should treat mm. them um, and kind of how that's used as a rationalization or justification for things in the world. And how does that come to exist? Because that's totally a human construction. You can't look at somebody's molecules or atoms or whatever and figure out whether or not they deserve to starve or if they have eaten while others have starved or if they have been generous, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, yeah, such, such an interesting and pervasive assumption. Yes. It's, it's one of the habits of authoritarianism, you know, uh, where, where what you get depends on, and not just authoritarianism, but also it's partly of, of humans as a social animal, you know, like, where, where your needs are not just met by your own efforts, but by the society around you or the authorities who you have to please. You have to at least conform to social expectations. And a lot of, you know, ideas of morality are actually um, uh, rituals of inclusion. You know, here's what you have to do to be accepted and included, and then you deserve and then we spiritualize that and imagine a God up there who meets out awards and punishments. And, um, but in nature, you don't see that, you know, like, like the seagulls, you know, like if one of them could just like take from another one, you know, it'll just do it. You know, it doesn't care about deserving like in nature. I mean, it is, um, I mean, those coyotes out here, you know, like, like they, take what they can get. And if you, if you're like, well, I, one of them was like, well, that would be really mean. So I'm not going to do that because I know that God will provide for me, you know, even if I don't go and take that, you know, other coyote, that, that other coyote's food, this is probably a really bad example. Coyotes are really pack animals and they probably share a lot, but, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like there's no, like, uh, extra material, like non-material arbiter of your behavior that says, well, you deserve and you do not deserve. And um, yeah, this is like woven into religion. And uh, it can be, a, a, I think, really helpful to shed that idea. Um, the only part of it that, that I think is, um, that I wouldn't shed too quickly is this connection. I mean, also, you know, but with, with, um, being a, a, a good member of society, um, but there's another way to look at that which is through the lens of gift and generosity and gratitude. And, you know, th those, those who in, in a healthy society, those who are generous and give to others will receive from others because they'll be grateful to you. And you could translate that into the language of deserving, but that's not really what's going on. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that like deserving has some use, you know, when it's good and positive and it is in alignment with, you know, what your soul wants, but um, that's only an aspect of deserving, right? Um, it, as long as you have the idea of people who are deserving of whatever, then you also leave the door open for people to be undeserving of whatever, just because, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I think, you know, you start getting away from the kind of the situations in which deserving can really speak to your soul. For me, it gets really pathological sometimes where I'm like, 
I'm like, oh, okay. Like one of my greatest pleasures right now is I do a cold plunge, my cold plunge tub. I get really cold. And then I get in a hot bath. Um, and I just bliss out, you know, I'll put headphones on, you know, and, and listen to music and, uh, I'll just bliss out, you know, and, and just, I'm just feeling so good, you know? And, um, but like, if I have not been productive that day, I'll be like, well, I don't really deserve to do that. Uh, I feel like, like, and, and, and how much do I have to do to actually deserve it? There's like almost no limit because, you know, how can I, you know, relax in the bathtub right now when there are, you know, Palestinian children whimpering in a basement and I might be able to do something like, how could I, how could I meet their gaze and, and say, well, while you were whimpering in a basement, hiding from bombs as your family got blown up, I was having a bath, you know, like I get this, this like, yeah. Um, and it's not like I, I, those are not the words in my head, but it's like this, th that would be like an exact, like a, a, an exaggeration of like this deep feeling of I've never done enough. And, and I think that maybe comes from a, um, an abuse of deservingness, um, by, you know, my upbringing, uh, by society. I, I don't know. Really, I'm not really blaming my parents here. You know, they were just, you know, um, they just channeled social attitudes and resisted them to some extent, but this was everywhere, you know, in school, um, even the idea of a dessert. <laughs> uh, so, it, it, but it kind of got into me um, where like, I've never done enough to, for what to deserve the good things. Um, yeah. Yeah. That I feel like everybody deserves everything and nothing. Right. You know, nobody, everybody, you know, has eaten while another is starved, but also everybody has been denied the treasure of Kings. Right. And so yeah. because you can, you can say that anybody deserves, you know, the highest praise or reward and also the worst punishment. Um, and so if your only reason for doing something or feeling some way is that you deserve that or somebody deserves that, I think that's an indication that you should maybe examine it from a couple more perspectives. Yeah. yeah. And this gets into new age, new age ideology too, where when, when good things happen to you, it's like, well, that's because I've been thinking positive thoughts, you know, and I've, uh -huh. I'm, I, I, it's, it's good karma, you know, I have I've generated good karma, you know, and I, I deserve my good fortune. No. <laughs> you know, there are some of the world's worst psychopaths and assholes who are at the pinnacle of society. And they have a yacht, you know, and a second home, you know, on the beach in Hawaii and so forth. The, uh, uh, there's a saying in the Bible, the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. Hmm. And, and I, I, I do think that this, um, you know, and then the, on the, on the other, on the other side, bad things happen to you, you have misfortune and it's like, okay, what's wrong with me? You know, what am I being punished for? And you might have done something that generates the misfortune. Like it could be that, you know, you got lung cancer because you were smoking two packs a day of cigarettes, you know, but that doesn't mean you are being punished for a moral transgression by getting cancer, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We don't understand why things happen and we try to make meaning out of it try to make sense of it. And those meanings can carry us for a while, but at some point, you know, everyone will, will, will hit a life initiation moment where 
you just cannot make sense of what is what is what is happening. Mm. And maybe that puts you back into that place you just talked about, Philip, of not knowing. You know, it's like this return to the youthful place that you want to that you are asking us to remember. Do you think you've, um, do you think you've, uh, inherited any of my, uh, hang up around, you know, not allowing myself good things because I don't deserve it? I tried not to pass it on to you, but you know, these things come out like unconsciously. Yeah, I think, I think I did when I was younger, you know, um, sometimes I would want to have candy. Um, but then I was like, oh, I shouldn't have candy, you know, like I, I, I should do something first so that I can have the candy, mm -hmm. you know? Like I should put away some dishes or whatever. And, you know, I'd always feel like I have to ask if it's okay for me to have a sweet, mm -hmm. you know, I have to make sure that it's okay and that I'm not, <laughs> I'm not being bad for it. Um, and I think I kept that attitude a little bit, um, but then I began to shed it. And then I read the Ursula K. Le Guin book, The Dispossessed. Mm -hmm. Um, and that really turned my idea of deserving and participating in society and like ethics and morality on its head. Um, mm -hmm. And then I began to question things a lot more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's actually like, I, I, I do my best not to manipulate children with rewards um, because it tends to replace intrinsic motivation with extrinsic motivation and, and, you know, cuts them off from a sense of what they actually want. Um, but, you know, it's, it's even in our language, you know, like, I, again, the word desserts, it's something that you deserve to have because you had a good dinner. <laughs> and yeah, like, I think if like, there were definitely times where I'm like, no, we're not having ice cream. You didn't even eat your, you didn't even eat your dinner, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah. I'm reminded now of school again. Um, when I was in first and second grade, I had a teacher, I think her name was Marilyn. Um, and I didn't know this really at the time, but she would kind of grade my homework and stuff. Maybe not too accurately. I'd get some questions wrong, but she'd mm -hmm. give me an A you know, um, and boy, I had so much fun learning in her class and uh -huh. I had such a great attitude towards learning. Um, but then I went into third grade and I had a different teacher and then, uh, I started really caring and stressing about my homework, you know, mm -hmm. because my grade, um, I, I was looking for the approval of my teacher. Um, right who would only give it to me in the form of a grade if I had gotten certain questions right, you right. know, whereas before I got approval just because I was such a wonderful, happy little boy. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. even though my grades did not reflect my work, I was so much more motivated to learn. Right. And this is, you know, to returning to the topic of what is school for, um, that's, you know, I mean, that's the example, that's a perfect example of replacing intrinsic with extrinsic motivation and making kids hate learning, you know, because the underlying assumption is you don't really want to be doing this. You're only doing this because of a grade, because if you don't get a good grade, your life is going to suck. So, and you're not going to get my approval. 
you know, the approval of these adult authority figures. So you lose yourself then. And, and, and I mean, what a ringing indictment of our society that kids hate school. Like they don't want to go to school. They hate learning. And the only thing they like about school is recess, you know? I mean, they still want to go because that's where the other kids are. But like to hate learning, I mean, that, I mean, that's what kids are supposed to do is learn, you know? Yeah. And, and so what's going on there? I think part of it is that this conditioning to do things you don't really care about because you're bribed or threatened by approval, which is a ticket to, for, for, I mean, a child, the approval of adults is, is, is the acceptance that, that keeps you safe and keeps you fed. Like, like baby mammals are terrified of parental rejection. That's the worst thing that can happen to you. Mm. So this, this mammalian instinct is leveraged to control kids, but it cuts them off from themselves. And then they grow up and they are already accustomed to denying that impulse that we were talking about the whole time of, of um, doing something meaningful that serves society, that serves the world, that contributes to life and beauty because they're, they're so conditioned to doing things for the rewards and avoidance of punishment that's, that is meted out by manipulative authorities. And so a lot of what we're about here and maybe Maybe one of the um, missions of your generation is to reclaim reclaim your authentic purpose and desire. And it's interesting that you t that that you were you were you know in that. If that's true, then our starting point about nihilism, which is the denial of purpose which also flattens desire is significant. You know, if that is, if, 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 if maybe part of the mission of your generation is to reclaim purpose and desire, then it would make sense that the condition from which that reclamation comes would be the denial of purpose and desire hmm. kind of all fits together. Yeah. And, and that actually is a pretty good uh, completion of the circle here. Do, do you want to um, do you want to uh, put the dot in the center of the circle, Philip, in the next couple of minutes? I'm, I'm not sure I understand what that means. Uh, I was. I'm just saying, like, like we kind of came full circle, and we've uh -huh. been on it for an hour. But is there something else you want to? Um, is there like one more piece? I'm just saying. Oh, yeah. I was actually just thinking that yeah a minute or two ago too, and I think I, I covered. I mean, I didn't come in fully knowing what I wanted to talk about, but mm -hmm. I think we hit upon most, most of the things. Yeah, that I was itching to express and to hear your thoughts on. We can do it again sometime too. I, 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 yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah. I hope I wasn't being too like. I don't know. I feel like I kind of dominated the conversation a lot. <laughs> um, if you're satisfied with it, then I feel, I feel good about it. Yeah, I'm definitely satisfied with it. Um, I'm definitely, you know, like I mentioned, I, what I don't want to lose when I'm 56, it's something that I really value. In most conversations, you'll find me if I'm not like, talking about some hobby or interest or TV show or whatever. Um, in conversations that I think are really rich, you'll find me listening more than speaking. Mm -hmm. um, kind of for that reason, there's just so much in the world. Mm -hmm. And I love listening to it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've noticed that about you, of course. Uh, all right, Philip. Do you want to um, 
yeah anything anything else you want to tell our uh, our listeners and watchers um about yourself or where can we find your uh, website you don't have a website <laughs> nothing like no. that no no um i guess maybe i'll shout out uh sudbury schools um mm -hmm. they allowed me the freedom to explore a lot of the ideas and um find a lot of the information that has brought me to where i am right now that i maybe would not have otherwise been able to devote so much time and resource to if i were mm -hmm. a public school yeah yes great yep you and Matthew and Jimmy all spent significant time at Sudbury Model Schools. Yeah, and I'm grateful for those two. All right. Um, yeah, thanks, Philip. This was a great idea. Uh, we'll have to thank mom. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure she'll, she'll be psyched to watch it too. Yeah. <laughs>